and we're preparing him to make a decision to resign himself to an icy fate while women and children escape in the lifeboats. We are really teaching him to internalize his own disposability. And baby girls, by attending to her crying so quickly, by letting her know she's inherently important to us, we're preparing her for the day she has to think of her own safety first, even if it means the man she loves is left standing alone with a rifle in front of a cabin. We're preparing her to take that seat in the lifeboat, we're training her to not allow guilt or empathy or acknowledgement of a man's humanity or any sense that he might just maybe deserve it more to convince her to give her seat to him. Because for millennia, the human species absolutely depended on her feeling 100% entitled to that seat. And that brings me to feminism. Not too long ago, uh, <laughs> I had it out with a feminist who had come into a male safe space uh, from a feminist blog, uh, just to scoff at the idea of male disposability. Um, she, she went there and basically said that the entire concept was a myth, that men's lived experiences were completely wrong, and that they were just a bunch of whiners who were complaining over nothing. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, that got me thinking about the concept of male disposability and how that interacts with the feminist movement. Male disposability has been around since the dawn of time. <laughs> uh, and it's based on, on one uh, very, very straightforward dynamic. Uh, when it comes to the well-being of others, they come first, men come last. This is, this is just the way it, it has always been. Uh, seats in lifeboats, uh, <laughs> being rescued from burning buildings, uh, who gets to eat? Um, Really, society places men dead last every time, and society expects men to place themselves dead last every time. Humans have always had a dynamic of women and children first, and that has not changed at all. Uh, the 93% workplace death gap has to be evidence of this, uh, if only because there's nobody with any kind of importance or power who's interested in changing it at all. In fact, I remember reading an article in a BC paper not long ago uh, that described the increasing proportion of female injuries on the job as a huge problem. And the insane thing was, the change reflected a decrease in male injuries rather than an increase in female ones. Men's injuries on the job had gone down because the economic downturn had put so many men out of work in the resource sector that there just weren't as many trees or pieces of heavy equipment falling on men as there had been before. And yet... This was framed as a huge problem for women that required immediate action to solve. Um, it, it's just crazy. Uh, it's like if men aren't dying at work at 20 times the rate women are, we must be doing something wrong as a society. Back when we were still living in caves, that attitude was necessary for human survival. Nature's a really harsh mistress, especially when you think of all the animals that never ever get to die of old age. Uh, things were a lot different for humans through most of our history on this planet than they are now. Life was dangerous, human settlements were small, isolated from each other, and one big disaster that took out a lot of women pretty much meant the end of the entire shebang for that group of people. So really, the level of importance that a human settlement placed on the well-being of women and children uh, reflected almost always how successful that settlement was, and that can be expanded to encompass entire societies. I keep hearing from the feminist camp that femaleness has always really been undervalued by society and that maleness is preferred, uh, but I've always contended that it's the exact opposite. The feminine is intrinsically and individually valuable, uh, simply because females are the limiting factor in reproduction of any species. Uh, when it comes to producing babies, every woman counts, whereas, biologically, one very happy man could probably do the work of hundreds in that regard. So, the level of instinctive importance we humans place on the safety and provision of women and their children, it's one of the main reasons why we've been able to be so successful that we've come to really dominate this planet. 
Hey guys, it's your girl Melanie and you told me, well not you, but some of you guys told me I needed to look up Karen, I think it's Strahan or Strawn, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I looked up her channel on YouTube and one of the videos that um, came to mind is, not came to mind, that struck a chord with me is feminism and the disposable male. And I was really curious about this. And it's so funny to me that what she, you know, I've, again, my channel started talking about relationships, calling out modern women, their behaviors, their mindsets, and really focusing on dating. But as I, again, as I, as I started looking at the issues out here, it, it just is really going nowhere. Most of the, you know, most of the men now are, well, not most, but a lot of the men have woken up. A lot of the things are focused on pointing out the behavior that women are doing, how illogical it is, and then also building up men and, and, and showing them that there's alternatives to what, you know, the world has told them is their only way. But now men know they can go their own way men, and without guilt and without shame and that they can embrace their freedom. They also, we also know that passport bros, they can travel and that they're valued. Men are, American men or men in, from the West are valued all over the world because of who they are. They actually have status. They actually are seen as a, a positive. Women actually wanna be with them and that women will, you know, are still feminine in those places and understand their traditional role and what men need and what men like. So I, I start to see that the issue is that Feminism across the board, the sexual liberation is where all of this started. This is, that is ground zero to what we're seeing today in society in the dating world. That is just a, the, the dating world is just a symptom of the root cause, which is the disease of feminism and sexual liberation. But it's like every time, you know, and I know you guys don't think I do, but I do read your comments for the most part. I don't always respond, um, but I do digest it. And a lot of the ideas and things that I get it, it, it helps, uh, move the needle along in my brain, listening to men, hearing their perspectives, hearing how they feel, the way they think is really important for me that I digest this directly from you guys. And as I hear these things, it, the thing I, that kept echoing, of course, we know feminism doesn't see the importance of men. It pushes men down. They're, they're men are supposed to be traditional. Men should sacrifice. Men should be silent. If men have opinions, it's misogyny and the patriarchy and they, they just aren't valued at all. And I never saw it like that because I've always valued men, but I didn't know the West in general hadn't, they really hate men. They really see them as disposable, but what she's saying here really goes deep. It cuts deep within me because it's just been expected, you know, that men should take the sacrifice. I talk about my blue collar brothers all the time and i talk about how they're the most powerful uh force within the west with around the world really because if every blue collar man went on strike for just a day it would collapse the entire world's economy and i do think blue collar men need to rise up and stand together um and, and that's a whole nother video i plan on doing but think about just the blue collar men how they do these dirty jobs they do the hard jobs they're expected to do it they're expected to go out there and work, be these workhorses, not to complain, not to, and to just take whatever it is that they get. And, you know, they don't go on TikTok and make rants and cry. And, and if they did, they will be shamed. They're not man enough. They're expected to silently do their work, suffer, and just be happy with it. And if you think about the sexual liberation and feminism, how it started, you know, women you were staying at home. They weren't able to go out and work. When, when they talk about going out to work, they're talking about these glamorous jobs, you know, corporate jobs where they could sit down at a computer, these jobs that seemingly have power and you make a lot of money from them. They're not talking about men who are working the pipelines, men who are, you know, uh, building skyscrapers or bridges, men who are uh, down into the, uh, in the sewer systems and doing the real hard work that keeps the world running. They're not fighting for equality there. They just expect men to keep doing those jobs, stay silent, support the world, don't be shamed by women, be looked over by women, honestly, be invisible to women. So they're not allowed to, to speak up. They're not even looked at in the dating market. The things that the reason why men would work hard and, and keep their head down and keep going is because the promise of being able to have a family and legacy and 
feeling like, feel like you're achieving something as a man, but as that has gone away, men are still expected to keep doing these things in silence. And if a man speaks up, it's now new with social media that that man will be canceled. If a man has speaks on his own rights, speaks on how he feels, speaks on pointing out what's going on or, or be proud of himself, women feel it's their obligation to cancel him and that how dare you speak? Just look at what happened with Simone Biles and Jamie Owens. He he's he sees himself as a prize, and they're like, "How dare you? She's achieved more, so she's the prize." This is how delusional they are. You aren't even allowed to have self esteem as a man. And so what she's saying, this is my first time really. I'm trying to connect the dots right here, but I just wanted to lay a foundation of what's going on in my brain. I like to give you guys this in real time, even though I can be very loquacious. <laughs> but I'm I'm starting to hear what she's saying that. Men went had to go to war. Men were disposable. Men have always been disposable. And, and it's just crazy to me that when I think about it, like, like, yeah, they were expected to die in war. They would protect women and children. And why inherently they say women are born with intrinsic value. And it's because we carry the wounds. We're able, the, the, the labor of carrying a child is, 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 it's, you know, a woman can only carry a child for nine months. Like it takes nine months to carry a child. It's much more intensive for a woman where a man can spread seed to hundreds of women within a short period of time. And so now it's the idea of feminism that we only need a few men. We need, and in, in the dating world, the way this translates, we just need these chats, these top guys, and the rest of you are of no consequence. You're just supposed to work. You're disposable. You're thrown away. And this is this profound. And while I will concede that this drive to keep women safe from all harm has often resulted in extreme limits being placed on women's mo mobility, uh, their agency, their power of decision to direct their own lives, uh, all through history in many cultures and in many cultures even today, uh, I think it's telling that those cultures tend to be the most backward. When you consider the restrictions placed on women in places like Afghanistan, and then you consider that if we bombed them into the Stone Age, it would be progress, I think you can conclude that the most successful societies had a really, really good balance between allowing women freedom and the ability to choose and direct their own paths in life and the need to protect them and provide for them. However, uh, feminists will insist that this, uh, these kinds of restrictions being placed on women in those kinds of societies are the ultimate form of, of objectification. Uh, you lock up your possessions to make sure that they will never be lost or stolen or harmed. Uh, honestly, if I were a guy on a battlefield, I might appreciate being objectified in that way. I think if I was going to be an object, I'd rather be a sexual one or somebody's prized possession than an object that can simply be thrown in the trash or smashed into pieces in the service of somebody else's purpose. Feminists also have a very, a very simplistic idea that our willingness to absolve women of their crimes, uh, slap them on the wrist, uh, spare them punishment, um, it comes from a deep disrespect society has for women's personhood. Uh, not seeing them as full human beings, capable of looking after themselves, that we see them as children who don't know any better. And yeah, well, there are parallels uh, there in our desire to protect both women and children from uh, not only their own poor decisions, but the full consequences of their shitty behavior. It's really not as simple as they try to make it out to be. I mean, seriously, even today, even today in 2011, uh, we fully expect that if it comes down to a, a man and a woman in a burning building and you can only save one, the expectation is that you choose the woman every single time. So honestly, whose humanity are we placing above who's here? We're not talking about going to work. We're not talking about getting an education. We're not talking about having the freedom to decide what you want to be in life. And we're not talking about getting to take Taekwondo. We're talking seats and lifeboats here. Uh, the person in the lifeboat is going to survive no matter how capable or incapable they are of managing their own life. And the person going down with the ship is going to die no matter 
how independent, self-sufficient, and awesome he is. I'm sorry, what just came to mind was that, okay, the reason why these concepts came to place, and I think it was formed in society, is because men are physically stronger, men are more logical, they're more capable in terms of fighting, in terms of, you know, carrying the heavier, heavier load physically. And, you know, and with that comes great responsibility, that this is why when women are mad about the patriarchy, well, men had the greater risk. They had all the responsibility. They bore all the burden. And women would just seem to keep raising the next generation, cook and clean and do these things, more traditional things that were not heavy lifters. They weren't burdensome in, in reality compared to what men had to do. But as I think about it and, and what she's saying here is that, you know, there is this this almost passed on that the real it's not a patriarchy that we've existed in it's a matriarchy in terms of the importance of women and protecting them and providing for women when they've always been able to live a more softer life being the weaker vessel men took on more of the risk so of course they were the ones that needed to decide more on the laws and the things going on in the world because they were the ones on the front lines of it. But what women wanted, well, we want those same rights. We want the same things, the privileges, seen as privileges that men get. We want those same privileges, even though we don't want equal responsibility, even though we don't want to work as hard, even though when given the opportunity, we don't go into blue collar work. When given the opportunity, we don't even go into STEM, which is now called STEAM. It's not science, technology, engineering, and math anymore. It's science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. And some people say, well, you know, the reason I include arts is because some of these graphic designers and, um, and uh, uh, architects and all of that, which could still go into engineering, that can still go into technology, that can still go into math because there is science behind that. But of course they have to include the arts, which we know why. So with more women, they can fill those quotas more. But I just think about it, women gravitate towards softer things. There's an expectation you do for me. I take, I take, I take, plus I wanna be in charge, even though I'm not willing to sacrifice my life, I'm not, willing to do the hard labor. I'm not willing to lay my life on the line the way men have been forced to do. Men have been forced to do these things. So it's just fascinating. That's the equation. One life more valuable than another. And the woman wins every time. So honestly, is there any argument anywhere that women's humanity has always been held in higher regard by society than men's. To be important to society, a woman merely has to be. A man has to do in order for his life to have any meaning to anyone other than himself. I think it was man-woman myth who said our society reduces men from human beings to human doings. And I really think that's an apt analogy. Uh, we measure a man's worthiness to wear the title of man <laughs> and therefore the title of human, through how useful he is, uh, either to society or to women. And one of the most useful things a man can do, even now in the eyes of society, is to put women and children before himself. And while I think there's plenty of argument that this attitude is at least- Let me just say this, and that is why they always say men are narcissists. Women would say men are narcissists, but really, women have become like petulant children and are narcissistic because they're used to a society that caters and panders to them, to their needs, to their wants, to their desires, to their emotions. Everything is designed toward making a woman feel good and a man should just take it. And so when a man doesn't wanna take your emotional abuse, when he doesn't pander to what you want, when he doesn't live up to the human doing that you expect him to be, because women don't see him as a human being, he's a human doing, what can he do for me? And this is why I'm now understanding why they say men, when they really love a woman, they love her, not what she can do for him. Some women will say, well, he, he just loves a woman because he gives him sex. He expect her to give him sex. That's part of an exchange of love and women act like they get no benefit from it. But women want a man to pay her bills, take care of the home, provide and protect. And even if he, she stays home and he works all day, 
works 40 to 80 hours a week at work. When he comes home, he's still expected to, to clock in for her share of the work. She doesn't go out and clock in for him after that and go to work after she stayed home all day watching soap operas, having to do some laundry and watch over her children that I thought motherhood was the greatest job of all and that all women love being mothers and it's just so great. Even that now women despise because it's not about self. I don't get to talk to adults. I don't get to go do this. I don't have my freedom anymore. When's the last time you heard a man say, I don't have freedom anymore because the lives of my wife and children are dependent on me, that we will go homeless and hungry. My children can die. We will, we will, we, my legacy is on the line if I don't go to work. So they just, they keep clocking in and they do it happily to knowing that it, it, it makes a man happy to make his family happy. It, it gives him a satisfaction, but for women, no. If a man, if, if everyone, if her children, if her husband, if the men, everyone, society's not making her happy, she's unhappy. It's about her happiness first. And this is why when a man sacrifices, when a man wants to marry you, when a man decides that it is so much more than just feelings, but then when he does it, he's taking the risk of losing everything because one day you're not happy anymore because it's not enough. Because society keeps telling you as a woman, you deserve more and more and more. And it is a narcissistic cycle. My God, guys, I feel like I've unlocked the next level in like Mario or something. <laughs> Partly innate, the way most survival traits are, even collective ones. Uh, if it starts in the chromosomes, we really do everything that we can as a society to reinforce this dynamic. Studies have shown that even though baby boys tend to cry and fuss more than baby girls, uh, parents are quicker to attend to or console a baby girl than they are a baby boy. Um, even just the level of acceptance of infant male circumcision in our culture, when female genital mutilation was banned pretty much the first afternoon we all heard it existed, it really says a lot about the differing expectations we have for males and females. I mean, speaking as a mother, uh, the last thing I would have ever wanted uh, was to hear my child cry especially when they're at an age when they're completely helpless, completely at the mercy of outside forces, and utterly dependent on the adults in their lives for every last thing. And yet, even knowing how painful that cut is, <laughs> we expect baby boys, only days old, for fuck's sake, to just suck that up. And just think about what even these very first interactions and experiences, these differences in how we nurture our babies, depending on what gender they are, what this teaches them. Uh, what do we teach baby girls when we attend to their crying so quickly? Uh, we teach them to ask for help because their needs are important. Uh, we teach them to let us know when they're afraid or in pain because it's important for us to know when they're sick or in danger or hurt uh, so we can do something about it. We teach them that when they're sad or lonely uh, to summon comfort and comfort will be there. We teach them that they're important. Uh, their needs and well-being, both emotional and physical, are important just because. And what are we teaching baby boys when we leave them to cry? We teach them there's not much point in seeking help because it will be grudgingly given, if at all. Uh, we teach them that they should become self-contained in their ability to deal with uh, emotions like fear, uh, helplessness, loneliness, sadness, pain, distress. We teach them stoicism. We teach them to suck it up. Uh, we teach them that their fear and their pain are things that are best ignored. We teach them that their emotional and physical well-being are just not as important as other things. I mean, given all of that, is it any wonder it's like pulling teeth to get a man to go to the doctor when he's sick? What we're teaching that baby boy is all the things a man needs to know and feel and believe about himself if he's going to stand in front of a cabin with a rifle while his wife and kids hide inside. We're preparing him for the day he has to fix a bayonet to a rifle and charge a hill under enemy fire. And we're preparing him to make a decision to resign himself to an icy fate while women and children escape in the lifeboats. We are really teaching him to internalize his own disposability. And baby girls, by attending to her crying so quickly, by letting her know she's inherently important. I'm sorry, guys, internalize his own disposability. Wow. I even, even I, you know, the things I say, men are workhorses, but I, I just an expectation that I have in society that men just are that way. But no, we've conditioned men like that. 
And of course there, there has to be balance. It, it used to be worth it for a man because these were seen as masculine traits to develop in, in our boys. But now girls want again, and then they, there were certain benefits when you sacrifice more, when you work harder, you get more benefits, you get more rights. But for some reason now it's no, I make no sacrifices. We, we raise girls still with the, sorry guys, if you hear noise outside, we raise girls with the idea that, you know, they can be just like a man. They could do this like a man, but they're not going to sacrifice like a man. Women don't want the responsibilities of men. They don't want those things, the same thing that men, men have to go through the conditioning. We don't want women like that. We don't expect them to, and we still coddle them as in their feminine roles, but then tell them they should have everything that a man has and even more and that he's disposable. Men don't matter. And we see this, you know, the data really shows out on dating apps. This is where I, I find it the most interesting where the large, the large, the hundred percent of women want this tiny percentage of men that they think look physically attractive. So we even now we require men to have physical beauty on the Fibonacci scale and that they're this Adonis body in order to be worthy of of procreation to be worthy of 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 a relationship of sex and even those things that are natural desire for men we shame them for oh he's objectifying me but then we objectify ourselves and we guys it's really convoluted what's coming out but it's like new new synapses new brain <laughs> matter my gray matter is like firing and i'm just seeing it it's like I thought I was seeing things in a macro way, but now this, like this woman has really expanded my thinking to another level and just work with me while it's, it's churning, the butter's churning, but it's, it, it's getting there. It may take a while, but it's getting there. Wow. To us, we're preparing her for the day. She has to think of her own safety first, even if it means the man she loves is left standing alone with a rifle in front of a cabin. We're preparing her to take that seat in the lifeboat. We're training her. Whoa, I know what she's going, guys. I Let me rewind it for a second so you can just hear this whole thing again, like put out. I'm sorry. I, th I know I messed it up. But just This was just so profound. I got to be quiet. Here we go. Here we go. Safety first, even if it means the man she loves. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to rewind it a little bit more, a little bit more. We got to get this. This whole thing. We fire and we're preparing him to make a decision to resign himself to an icy fate while women and children escape in the lifeboats, we are really teaching him to internalize his own disposability. And baby girls, by attending to her crying so quickly, by letting her know she's inherently important to us, we're preparing her for the day she has to think of her own safety first, even if it means the man she loves is left standing alone with a rifle in front of a cabin. We're preparing her to take that seat in the lifeboat, we're training her to not allow guilt or empathy or acknowledgement of a man's humanity or any sense that he might just maybe deserve it more to convince her to give her seat to him. Because for millennia, the human species absolutely depended on her feeling 100% entitled to that seat. And that brings me to feminism. You know, the patriarchy smashers, those righteous avengers of equality, uh, dogged dismantlers of every single gender role. What exactly is feminism doing to dismantle this traditional role of the disposable male? Feminism's greatest victories have only reinforced in everyone that society still owes women provision, protection, help, and support just because they're women. In its collective dismissal and abandonment of male victims of domestic violence, it only reinforces in men that it's pointless for them to ask for help because men's needs are of no relevance and their fear and pain don't mean anything to anyone. Feminism teaches us to put women's needs at the forefront of every single issue, uh, political or social, whether that issue is domestic violence law, sexual assault law, institutional sexism, social safety net, education funding, homeless shelters, Government funding for shovel-ready jobs that didn't stay shovel-ready once feminists got wind of them. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look, there are feminists pushing their way to the front of the line, demanding women's fair share of all of the goodies, the good stuff, the, the loot, the booty, the cookies. Even if women don't need it, even if women don't deserve it, and even if somebody else needs it and deserves it more. 
and they get it because we give it to them. Feminism has done nothing but exploit this dynamic of the expectation on men to put everybody else before themselves, especially women. Women's safety and support, women's well-being and women's emotional needs always come first. This is the most stunning piece of society-wide manipulative psychology I think I have ever come across. Feminism has been on the down low with old school chivalry right from the start, and they might seem like strange bedfellows for sure, but they're not, because both concepts are built on a firm foundation of female self-interest. We made our way as humans through a really harsh history, and we became the dominant force on this planet, and one of the reasons we were so successful is because we have consistently put women's basic needs first. Guys, I'm sorry, what just came to mind, I mean, this is so deep, I'm gonna have to watch this a few times on my own, really dissect it. This is really transforming the way I'm even, I mean, this is adding so much. But even if you aren't like a, a, a Christian, what, you know, I am, and the way I was raised when it thinks, you know, um, they're trying to change the genders now, the Church of England was debating whether they should uh, take the masculine pronouns away from God as he labels himself in the image of a man. Um, but then he sacrificed his son, Jesus Christ. Like when you look at the sacrifice, who made the sacrifice, even God himself chose a son, a form of a man to sacrifice for the entire world. I mean, even in willingly doing it. And he think about the garden of Gethsemane when he was praying the Lord's prayer and he, the fear that he still had fear, he still had human emotions, but despite his own humanity, his, despite that he was willing to dispose of self to save others. And I'm sorry, that just came to mind when we talk about that, that even in, 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 in mythology and in, 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 in religion, it is usually the sacrifice of the man, the male figure for the, for the good of others. And, and they just are taught to accept that. And now they're told to accept it with feminism with no benefits and to shut up akin to slavery. Like, honestly, like, like this is, it, it's the, a same, the, a, Obviously it's not the exact same thing. I'm not saying that, but you can see the correlations of it, of a silent, to be silent and told to just work and to just take what you get and to have no rights and to have no, nothing that benefits you. And if you, if someone's just unhappy with you, they can destroy your life, take away your children, take away everything that you have. My God, I can be honest. I would hate to be a man. I, I'm just, y'all, I have so much empathy and sympathy right now for it, but this is just opening my eyes and it's just really depressing. I can see why some men would be so angry. You're told to, I mean, this is just ingrained in you as a child and society just expects it. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting, uh, their need for safety, support, and provision. It was in humanity's best interest for women to be essentially self-interested and for men to be essentially self-sacrificing. But we don't need that dynamic anymore. I mean, our species is in no danger of, ex of extinction. I mean, we're seven billion people clogging up the works here. What's the worst that could happen if we all just collectively decided that men were no more disposable than women and women were no more valuable than men? In fact, the greatest danger I see to us right now is that in our desperation to bend over and give women everything they want and everything that they say they need, we've unbalanced society to the point where we're just in danger of seriously toppling over. And really, the only difference I see between the traditional role and the new one for men with respect to disposability is that maleness, manhood, it used to be celebrated, it used to be admired, and it used to be rewarded because it was really fucking necessary and because the personal cost of it to individual men was so incredibly high. But now? Now we still expect men to put women first, and we still expect society to put women first, and we still expect men to not complain about coming in dead last every damn time. But men don't even get our admiration anymore. All they get in return is to hear about what assholes they are. Is it any wonder they're starting to get pissed off? Anyhow, that's not all I have to say about this subject. Uh, but it is all I have to say about it today, since my kid is about to walk in the... Ooh, child!
Karen, Miss Lay. I am about. Oh my gosh. And this was 2011, guys. This is before Me Too, before social media really popped off, before canceling a man for just speaking up. This is before TikTok. Look at where we're headed. Look at where we're headed. Look at how it's gotten so much worse for men. And people wonder why I do this work. It, it's not, you know, people just to wonder why are you doing this, whatever. I, I really have always been a very curious person. Uh, as a child, I would read like two books within a week in like novels and just really just absorb information. And I don't come from, obviously I have my own biases as a woman because I was born and conditioned as that. But um, I would say my foundation actually growing up uh, in the Southern Baptist church where men were actually put first, like you were taught about submissiveness, you were taught certain things. These concepts don't, they don't hurt me. Like they, they make sense. Um, and that's why when I'm hearing these things just on this level now, it, you know, I, I, when I see injustice, when I see what's going on, when I hear from men, it's like, I'm discovering a new <laughs> alien race. I know, shut up. Don't say anything. But when, even when y'all leave comments and I hear how you think, and I'm starting to see, understand and put myself in your shoes, it's actually fun for me. I, I would not want to be you. I, like, I will not lie. No capping. But it's fun for me to see this because I'm just, I see, I don't know, maybe I'm just called to it. I don't know why, but it, this just really opened a new door for me. I know this was a very heavy one. This was very serious, but I think it was very important to hear this. Hopefully I will do more of her um, videos if you guys want me to, um, breaking these downs. I don't, I don't know where this is leading me, where eventually this road will lead, but I think this opens a door that a lot of women and hopefully can open a lot of women's eyes to these concepts and so that we can hopefully move the needle in some direction. Um, but anyway, leave a comment below, make sure you subscribe and I will see you on the next one. Your girl need to go lay down for a second. <laughs> Bye.